we will be recording the session. So I'm just letting you know. So for that reason, I'm going to ask everybody to, who is not a presenter to remain mute until we get to question time. You can post your questions in the, ch in the chat room. And when the presenters are through, we will take the questions and uh, co other contributions you would wish to make. We're going to take them in order. Uh, this evening, our presentation is going to be on One Lab's approach to ISO 17025 compliance. And that present presentation will be made by the team from the Water Authority of the Cayman Islands. Uh, we have with us this afternoon, our lead presenter is going to be Mrs. Marcella Martinez Ebanks. Yes. She is the. She is the. She's a chemist by training and is the laboratory manager at the Water Authority of Cayman. Um, she has had over 25 years with the authorities' laboratory. She has attached the. Has watched the laboratory more than double its staff complement, obtain accreditation from the American Association for Laboratory Accreditation, and witness an almost tenfold increase in the number of samples processed by the laboratory. Mrs. Ebanks holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chemistry from the Union College, Lincoln, Nebraska, USA, a Master in Leadership, as well as a class Classes one to four certification. She's a level four certified um, ABC laboratory analyst and level four water laboratory analyst. And she'll be assisted by Mr. Jerry D. Banks, laboratory technologist at the Water Authority of the Cayman Islands. So I'm going to invite them to take over. And it's your show, please. Sorry, I didn't have all the bio on Mr. Mr. Banks, so you may um, introduce him for us, please. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm not sure how many of you can see us, but um, Jerry has been with the Water Authority for us for a couple of years. He started as our laboratory technician and within a year or so moved up to the laboratory technologist. He's very proficient in computer and programming, which he will tell you a little bit more about later. As has been introduced, I want to thank you all for giving us this opportunity to share a little bit about what we do here. And as was mentioned, our presentation is entitled One Lab's Approach to ISO 17025 Compliance. And um, we've titled it as such because we recognize that there's multiple ways that labs can reach compliance to ISO 17025. So we just want to share a little bit of the details with you. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. Okay. The objective of, pre of our presentation today is to discuss a little bit about the 17025 standard. Um, it's a minor detail, but we want to share with you, or we hope to share with you, some of the approaches that we have taken to implement um, compliance to the 17025 standard. Specifically, we would like to discuss um, six, section 6. competency. Section 7.7, .7, which relates to ensuring the validity of results, which is probably the area where we have encountered the most difficulty. And um, how we have addressed some of the internal risk and opportunities as listed in Section 8.5 of the standard. I'll begin first by providing you with a brief overview of the lab's ISO 17025 accreditation journey. Our lab obtained accreditation to the 17025 standard in 2002, and we initially began with a very small field of accreditation. It consisted of five chemical parameters, three microbiological parameters. We did the most common water parameters, the total and free chlorine, conductivity, total dissolved solids, pH, um, total coliforms, thermal tolerance, and HPC were our initial eight parameters. 
In 2019, we were able to add six additional chemical parameters. Uh, currently, our scope has 24 chemical parameters and six microbiological parameters spanning both portable, non-portable, and air matrices. Um, it is primarily my responsibility to ensure compliance to the 17 or 25 standard, and when I am not present, then it's JD's responsibility. But as a standard details, every staff member has responsibility for ensuring that we are meeting the requirements. Our staff constitutes of myself, JD, and another technologist, three lab technicians, and one sample collector. I thought I'd add pictures of some of the staff you're not seeing today. Um, a little bit about our workload. Um, last year, we averaged, uh, well, we had about 48,000 samples. This is primarily drinking water samples and RO water sample matrices, and that constitutes 91% of our workload, and these are, in essence, our product water and our raw water. In addition to the somewhere over 48,000 samples that we do a year, the lab is also, also performs QC analysis samples as part of every analytical batch. Roughly in 2019, we averaged about 38% of our workload was QC samples. This figure increased significantly after 2018 when we switched from the 2005 version of the standard to the 2017 standard. Um, we saw a 20% increase in the number of yearly samples in comparison to the 2017. QC samples are an important aspect of our quality system because in addition to providing confidence in the results of each analytical batch, we also use the data from the QC samples to measure analyst competency, which is a major aspect of the 17 or 25 standard. Section 6.2 of the ISO standard places significant emphasis on personnel competency, specifically not only on their competency to carry out the analytical task, but also to detect any deviations in the analytical process. So the analyst must be well-versed and competent in those methods in order to detect those deviations. What we have found that has worked well when we're evaluating competency is to use a multi-prong approach. So one, we are looking for something that's objective. We're looking for something that is data-driven. We're also looking for something that's completely comprehensive and takes into account the whole entire process. And lastly, we're looking for some um, evaluation of competency that's both ongoing and re-evaluated periodically. We use five main tools in order to measure staff competency. QC samples for analytical batch, as I've already mentioned, is one of them. We also use uh, an inter laboratory comparisons or the comparison of results between analysts for a same sample as a measure of competency. Um, this is particularly important for the microbiological parameters where it's difficult to get PT samples or commercially available spikes for those. Additionally, we use random observations, and these must be documented observations at the time that they happen, or while the analyst is performing his or her tasks. And lastly, um, the review of that data is also used, sorry, I should mention, and proficiency testing samples is our major way of establishing both initial demonstration of capabilities and continuing demonstration of capabilities. The number of PT samples that we will perform in a year usually exceeds our minimum requirement for A2LA, and we have found that by increasing the amount, we can ensure that we're remaining compliant. Um, A2LA standard requires that we have at least two PT rounds per year for every parameter that's on our scope. But because we're also using it as, an as a measure of analytical competency, we have an internal policy that requires every analyst to successfully pass at least one PT for every parameter on scope every year. Um, PT data then is used to help to identify gaps in staff competency. Once we receive results of a PT sample, those results are then used, we use a BB macro to import those into a database and from which 
from the database, we can produce on-demand reports that are available to view trends by analyst, by parameter, by the time period. Um, I've got an example of one of those reports, and this would be the 2019 proficiency test results. And this looks at each analyst. I have removed the analyst name and just left them as numbers, but you get a good idea of what the variation of competency across different analysts is. So this is periodically reviewed in order to identify where an analyst may have a gap in their competency. Another key aspect of ensuring staff competency and validity of test results is the identification of trends or biases in the data that's generated by each analyst. Um, this is a task that JD actually performs on a weekly basis. So as shown here, this is just um, a slice of data that I would review on a given week. This is for one of our locations. We have multiple locations. Before we used to print this off and individually look at each data point and highlight it if we see something wrong. But how do you determine that if any of the values shown meet our, our target use distribution criteria? You have to do mental math in your head, right? Example, is this number between two and 400? But with Excel, it does what no human with a book can. It computes hundreds of calculations within a second. As Ms. Marcella showed you, we generate tens of thousands of data points per year. It would take ages to perform all the calculations needed to deeply analyze data for typos, biases, and trends. Someone like me who is very familiar with this data could still miss errors and have personal biases to overlook them. Section 7.7.1 .7 requires us to have a procedure of mon for monitoring the validity of results and be recorded in a way that trends are detectable. Data recorded within Excel spreadsheets can be analyzed with simple if logic rather than diving into more complex coding. The example I'm showing here is the, is the logic. If conductivity ratio is outside of specification, flag this sub right red for review. So as soon as I paste the data into this template, It'll, it'll either flag it okay if it's good or red if it's bad, and I'll do further review from there. This data point shows a ratio of 3.81, while everything else is 2.08. Section 7.7.1 .7 goes on to, to say that statistical techniques shall be applied during review where practicable, with Part I specifically mentioning review of results. So every week, I put the week's data set through various statistical checks using Excel. The last slide's flag value was reviewed, and it was determined to be a simple typo. Instead of a ratio problem, this value on this slide was flagged due to having a significantly higher z-score than the other measurements taken during the week. And we applied this to our proficiency test to where a score above two would be the very crash mode result, whereas below two, we determined that to be a pass. Now, this will talk this questionable pH reading had the technique audited and an inconsistency was discovered. This could be due to COVID disrupting our workflow where a lot of staff has been at home primarily working from home and they haven't had their regular opportunities to go in the field and perhaps over time they lost their technique. The analyst was then provided retraining demonstrating that statistics can be can help identify individual training needs of staff while also being a very useful tool to ensure compliance to the standard. So that's how we, or a slight preview of how we deal with risk with our analysts. We also have to address risk with our instruments. A, a quick background is that one sheet doesn't fit all, and I will go into detail about this. This graph shows the average days since last calibration until the instrument was found out of tolerance. The names are instrument one, two, three, four, but they're all the same make and model. So the most common measurement instruments used by our lab and the operations department are modern 6 PII instruments. They're deployed at all four of our plant locations and are used by different operators in different water matrices and even different islands. They're used within the authority to obtain standard water quality readings such as pH, conductivity, and total dissolved solids. Section 6.4.6 requires that measuring instruments be calibrated, which our lab maintains responsibility for meeting. The instruments were assigned for a full check and calibration on a fixed once a month schedule that was rotated between our lab technicians. As mentioned in section 6.4.10, we perform intermediate checks and continuing calibration verifications. Between calibrations, it was found that some instruments had drifted out their accepted tolerance, while some missed their due date for a monthly calibration and still passed verifications on a weekly basis. 
the manufacturers recommended interval 30 days were preferably for instrument treaty, as you can see, but not all of them. We suspect the cause to be that some locations have matrices on their operators that deteriorate sensors much faster than expected, while some have near perfect operating conditions. So when you calibrate, you need to make a record. And the saying goes, if it isn't broken, why fix it? Well, writing has been a standard way of writing. Writing has been a standard way of recording data for centuries. When our instruments were calibrated by one of our analysts, before even beginning to work with the instrument, a book had to be rolled up. Comments about the condition of the instrument, battery changes, sensor changes, along with the post-calibration readings were written down. This takes time, and to make matters worse, worse books don't come with a search bar. Section 6.4.7 of the standard requires that our instrument's calibration program be reviewed and adjusted to ensure confidence in their calibration status. The failure showed that we needed to change our 30-day interval to a more appropriate length of time that would prevent instruments from being found out of calibration. However, our calibration records were what it felt like locked away in an open notebook. When we began reviewing our written calibration data, it became evident that the resources required to flip back and forth between records to determine trends and risks with each instrument are immense. If I could roughly estimate the time spent to write up the book, calibrate the instrument, perform relevant calculations by hand, review historical data, then assign an appropriate interval could take at least an hour. So what eventually happened is that we transitioned our calibration records from paper to digital, to digital records using Microsoft Excel. But we came to learn that Excel is a lot more than just equal sum. One day I decided that I had enough of ruling out and flipping back and forth when reviewing an instrument's historical data. So I decided just to enter it all into an Excel spreadsheet. So the next time I returned to calibrate that instrument, all the data was already there in the spreadsheet waiting for me. And I could review, compare, and manipulate the data in a significantly more efficient manner than using a physical book. The only problem I found was that there were 70 plus columns to enter calibration data into it which obviously didn't really make it into a very user-friendly system. You may ask, why not just purchase custom calibration software for your instruments? We developed our own in-house calibration software, and we named it Lockmaster. There's a lot on screen now, I'll go through it after I um, speak. Excel has a powerful supplement called VBA that allows you to create your own custom data entry forms and much, much more. As Marcella brought this up earlier, where she said we use a VBA macro to import our P3 results. We had already taken a few online courses related to coding in our own time, so despite the challenges presented, we were able to use existing resources as a solution to ensuring compliance. Custom software can cost tens of thousands of dollars, not including tech support fees. By developing our own software, we can tune it to our needs at will and have full control over design and functionality. I've looked into various calibration software and some come with features that contribute to the high cost, and we may, we may not even need those features. Let me give you a brief rundown on how, how, how this works. Up top, the analysts can enter a serial number which is attached to, to a location. They can quickly fill in the last lock numbers used for their buffers because we have to record everything, buffer locks, buffer expiry dates, and every time the meters were calibrated, that was rewritten over and over again. When you think about it, it's very inefficient. Um, instead of writing conditions, the most commonly um, encountered conditions are just um, ticked off instead of written. Resource management, which is basically inventory on the fly. So at the end of the year, if I need to order sensors, I just go back and check how many sensors or how many batteries were used over that time period. This can generate PDF reports and also calibration due date stickers, which is required by the standard. It looks very complex, and yes, it took time, but the time taken to rule up every page of the notebook is comparable to the time I spent creating the software. The difference is that when no the notebook is finished, you file it with, the, with 50 other books and then start all over again on the 51st. Creating the user form for simple data entry purposes takes a shorter amount of time in comparison to developing the actual calibration algorithms. On the other hand, executing the 1,000 lines of code takes a few seconds. Can you imagine how long it would take for a human to do so by hand multiple times a week? This is a description or a graph of our calibration algorithm at its default state. 
Now we'll go into more detail. So to ensure validity of our results, we need to catch instruments before they go out of calibration. Section 8.5.3 states that the actions taken to address the risk of the instrument shall be proportional to the validity of results. Initially, we tried using a static linear correlation between calibration score and a set interval between calibrations. However, it was found that with a linear correlation, the instrument's calibration interval wasn't tightened quick enough, resulting in instruments still being thrown out of calibration. This showed that a linear correlation would not provide the desired response. If you want to visualize this, just draw a straight line from the very top of that curve to the very bottom. If you notice, as the score goes along, the calibration interval doesn't decrease as quickly. By basing our algorithm off of a dynamic y equals inverse x function, the interval between calibration drops significantly faster if any problems are detected. As soon as the pre-calibration data indicates that a sensor is beginning to drift, the interval is tightened to prevent an instrument falling out of calibration before it returns to the lab. With the transition to digital records, we also had more time to, write more to record more information, and we decided to also record as found our pre-calibration data. Prior to calibrating, the buffers used to calibrate are read on the meter to measure sensor drift. So a meter checked against a pH buffer 7 with a reading of 6.8, would have a very poor score compared to a meter with a reading of 6.99. When the analyst submits the record, hundreds of lines of code run in the background that analyzes the current and prior calibration records for the instrument and updates its risk value. As some data is weighted heavier than as left data for risk calculations. If you can see in front of the, the, the X, there's a number, pay attention to that because that introduces a dynamic element to our function. This graph shows an instrument that has a history of keeping calibration past 30 days. Calibration scores are calculated and used to determine the interval with a default max of 30 days, as I mentioned. The, the, the dynamic aspect of our calibration algorithm takes effect when individual instrument risk values are incorporated into our calculations. As demonstrated before, one shoe doesn't fit all, and on the default function proved to be still too tight or relaxed with some instruments. Good scores decrease the instrument's risk value, resulting in the algorithm calculating the interval using a relaxed function similar to this, with a good score allowing calibration interval over 30 days. This decreases unnecessary work done by analysts and allows resources to be diverted to more problematic instruments. So this is a problematic instrument and it has a history of failing under 30 days. So when it was assigned a 30-day calibration interval, when we would get it back at the next 30 days, we would find it out of calibration almost all the time. So problematic instruments with a high risk of being thrown out of calibration impact their validity of our data. Therefore, the algorithm calculates this due date with a tightened tighten function. Should this instrument be found with a near-perfect score, instead of 30 days default, it will return for calibration within a week. So, but what happens if it continues to have a good score? If no further pre-cal failures are detected, the algorithm assumes lowered risk and slowly increases the max days allowed. So instead of 10 days max, probably the next time would be about 14. Over time, since the algorithm makes objective adjustments on its own based on data rather than personal biases, a sweet spot will be hit, resulting in a meter coming in at the optimal time. As mentioned in section 8.51 of the standard, this works to reduce potential failures in our activities automatically. In a nutshell, the idea behind our dynamic algorithm is to let the computer do the heavy listing, lifting and decision making based off of predetermined criteria, collected data, and calculated risk. So for a summary, when evaluating staff competency, use objective data-driven decisions. This avoids biases. Utilize different methods to determine competency that, that we discussed, such as PTs and QC samples. Go beyond single data point reviews and incorporate statistics. One data point doesn't say, that, say the, so, the whole story. Improving efficiency of your operations frees resources that can be diverted elsewhere. Increased resources for problematic areas result in improved validity and easier compliance to the standard. In conclusion, the 2017 version of 1705 placed greater emphasis on identification 
and management of risks, as well as the use of technology. Meeting these requirements within budgetary and staffing constraints requires creativity. Thank you for listening. We'll be happy to answer any questions. And there's anything that you think of an hour from now that you don't get to ask, feel free to send us an email to the email provided. Right, thank you very much uh, for your sourcing presentation. Um, colleagues who are listening, if you should have any questions, I haven't seen you post any in the chat, but feel, please feel free to, to put up, raise your hand or ask your question as we go on. Okay, well, it's a way that I might put in a question myself to ask, um, what, how has the, I think you mentioned some of the, you may have had a bit of disruption during your, the COVID period. How has that affected your operations and how will you, what will you have to do to be able to, if would you need to do any recalibration because of the COVID um, disruptions? And um, what we did actually, and almost to the end of March, when the government issued shelter in place orders, we scaled down the lab operations to what was deemed only essential, and that was our drinking water monitoring. Okay. Um, and instead of having seven technicians in or seven lab staff in, we scaled down to two members a day. Um, they, it did affect some instrument calibrations, um, instruments that were not regularly used were just taken out of service and then um, our a2la provided us the option of documented de documenting deviations from the standard as part of our response to covid which we have done and that's how we'll remain in compliance with the standard we have now as of last week monday reopened the authority to customers and we are slowly bringing staff back in Currently, we have four staff in so that we can meet the government requirement of six, six feet distancing in the workplace. Okay, we have a question here from Mr. Ezekiel Francis of the Wasco in Dominica. I think. Go ahead, Ezekiel. Okay, uh, do you, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, let's see if we, we call it a sample for a bacteriological test. And then we have uh, uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 milligrams per liter of free residual chlorine. Now, when we, we, we read that those results and we got total coliform bacteria. So based on your experience, would you say that this sample was contaminated either when it was being collected or during the analysis? Well, if not, then what could have happened? Oh, um, and We've had it happen when we've collected a drinking water sample and we've had what we deem sufficient chlorine residual in the system, but we've still gotten a positive total coliform. Our procedure requires we resample and confirm that one. In addition to that, we backtrack through the QC, and which is why the QC has multiple um, uses for us. If the QC was acceptable and there were no flags, then the result is deemed reportable. Um, having said all of that, from experience, we, there are cases where there's a genuine total coliform in there, even though you've got enough chlorine residual, and you can have, in essence, bacterial plugs that it sometimes come out. We don't see them very rare. We don't see them very often, I should say. And I think in the 25 years, I think I've only ever seen one case where we had a total coliform with chlorine residual that was actually validated. Okay, we have, a, I think, um, Andre, you could go ahead with your question, um, if you're... Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you okay, please. Hi, uh, yeah, quick question for you guys. Um, we've been having issues with the Hawk um, handheld probes and, and the, the handheld unit, and I was wondering if anyone had uh, a good experience with the alternate brand. Okay. When you say the Hawk probes, you're using it for pH or...? Yeah, pH and dissolved oxygen, sorry, for wastewater. Um, and um, we are using the Hack Sense Ion for our pHs. 
Um, we have been using it for probably about eight or nine years. We haven't had any issues with it, except that it can become the case, um, sorry, the electrolyte solution in it becomes contaminated periodically, so we have to replace it. Um, with the hack, we're using hack LDO, no, sorry, we're using YSI for DO meters. We switched from the hack DO meters probably more than 15 years ago. Um, we found that the YSIs gave us more stab stable readings. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I, we have a question from El, Mr. Elvin Roberts. Go ahead, Elvin. Uh, we are not hearing you. We, we seem to have an audio problem. What you can do is to type your question in and I then can ask it on your behalf. Uh, no, we are having. Um, okay, we will then go to Jamal Howell. Um, since we're not hearing Elvin, Elvin, please type your question in. We can't hear you. Hi, good afternoon. Yes, yes, go ahead, Jamal. Not sure. We lost you. Not, I'm not sure if uh, this ISO standard speaks to hazardous. Uh, material, but we were wondering um, how your lab deals with storage of ha hazardous material, hazardous waste. Um, first part, the standard doesn't specifically address um, how you handle the hazardous material, but it is assumed that your SOPs will have hazardous management in there. Um, we do not have any facility to treat hazardous waste in Cayman. And uh, what we do is we, as, in essence, stockpile it and then hand it over to the relevant authority who then takes care of packing it up and getting it shipped off. But it is an expensive venture. Well, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, I was wondering if um if you store them in the vials that they're tested in, like that you do testing, or if you just dump them all in one drum, if you pour them all together. No, um, what the Department of Environmental Health, who's the regulating authority for handling waste, they prefer that we keep it isolated as much as possible. It makes it easier when they have to actually get the ports to for disposal. So as much as possible, we keep it in its original container. Do we have any other questions or comments that you wish to share with us, colleagues? Okay, there's, there's, a, there's a question from Gary Pilgrim. You, you, do you want me to read it or you want to go ahead? You, you can go ahead and ask. Okay, he, um, he's asked me to read it. So he's asked um, for clarity, the accreditation standard for the lab mentioned, was this a higher standard international compared to the local standards required for lab accreditation or is the international standard the default? Yeah, I'm sorry, we have no local um, requirements for accreditation here. Uh, the ISO standard is the international standard for labs, so particular test and calibration labs. Yeah, and, and I, should have, I should have said in the introduction that um, the WAC laboratory is, is I think, I, I stand corrected, but um, it has been accredited since 2002, and it became the first laboratory in the Caribbean specializing in water and wastewater analysis to be internationally accredited by the A2 
AFLA, um, that is the Association, American Association for Laboratory Accreditation. I, I'm not sure that I know of any other utility, water utility laboratories that are so accredited. I, am, I, I think the Turks and Caicos has one now. Turks and Caicos has, has accredited now. I know that we were also trying with Antigua. Um, we've been trying to find ways to have a water operators partnership between yourselves and Antigua. Um, mm-hmm. But that has not been forthcoming as we would have liked. But now everybody has gone, um, we are using the virtual platforms. I think we may well be able to start something off virtually in the, in the first instance. Yes, um, I see we have a question from Ezekiel. Yes, I saw that in your presentation that your, your lab staff that you have, let's say one, well not one, but you have someone for collecting samples and then you have the lab tech for analyzing and I'm not sure if you have them someone else to read. So my question is, have you come across any other labs who are the same, the same tech to collect samples, do the analysis and still read? And if yes, then how do you, com- you, you compare their results to yours? Um, I don't know of any other labs who are using a lab a sam- a sample collector. Um, but 11 years ago, one of our technicians who did not particularly like to have to go out in the field because we rotated the field part of our work, suggested that we hire someone to do strictly the field collections. Um, and it has worked really well for us. I don't know of anybody else doing it. Now, having said that, our sample collector is part of our lab staff and has to undergo all the requirements to the ISO. So when the auditors from the US usually come, one of the first things that they want to see is they want to go out with him and verify that his procedures are up to the standard. Um, I should have mentioned in addition to meeting the ISO requirements, we're also ILAC compliant. Um, which is the international version of the U.S. NELAC standard. So we're also considered NELAC compliant. So when we're audited, we are audited to both the uh, ISO 17025 standard and the U.S. NELAC standard, and that would include our sample collector. He also has to undergo multiple proficiency test samples a year, and he has one of the highest pass rates, actually. Okay. So in I don't have another lab to compare results to other than our PT samples, which are comparisons with multiple US and UK laboratories. Thanks. Okay, I think Elvin has typed his question in. It's, it reads, um, where programming side of things are concerned? I see that you referred to Excel on the front end. I heard you mention scripts embedding in your programming to support this on the back end. May I ask which languages you utilize to achieve this? Also, which module in Excel did you use? So the software that I just that I just showed you is all in VBA. So the language is Visual Basic. Um, in terms of the back end for our calibration records, when I say database is, is basically a hidden worksheet. So the calibration analyst can't access the raw data. It's submitted through the user form and we call the database just a hidden locked away sheet. Um, But in terms of our actual analytical data, we use uh, a LIM software based on Microsoft Access and it uses SQL for the backend. All right, any other questions, colleagues? Okay. I'm not see- I'm not seeing any more questions at this point, so thank you very much for allowing us to share with you. Yes, thank you very much, um, Marcella and um, your colleague, um, Jerry, for joining us this afternoon. We, we really want to continue this to give, our, um, give an opportunity to our operators, um, you know, during this period when we cannot do a lot of face-to-face 
um, activities. Um, just before I close, I think I see I have somebody saying that there are copies of the results from samples required to be submitted to any local regulatory body for compilation and review. Um, I think the short answer is no. Um, the longer answer is up until probably two years ago, um, the Water Authority had two separate departments. One, in essence, functioned as a regulator. That has now changed to a government department known as Office of Regulation. So currently, we are not required to submit our sound, any sort of results to the regulator. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, I was saying that um, before the question, um, that we are, this is a series of web, a webinar series, and we have multiple um, topics for um, discussion and presentation. Um, next week, um, the presentation is going to be from Cyril Casimir of, of Trinidad. She's going to present on water quality monitoring. And on July 15th, we're going to partner with the Operators Without Borders of um, British Columbia, Canada. And they will be presenting on occupational safety for water operators. And we'll be looking at um, PPE safety as well as working in, um, in, in sort of trenches and hazardous areas and some of the protocols to be observed, um, particularly following the International Labor Organization guidelines. So we, we ask you to keep in touch with us. The, this webinar is recorded and we are going to put it on the Kawasa YouTube um, channel and we will share them with persons who participate in, in the webinars and we ask you to also follow our, our Facebook pages and we do have um, our water operator podcasts and feel free to email us should be there, there be some topic you would wish us to, to put on the agenda. So thank you very much for your participation and thank you very much um, Martina and Jerry and uh, also, please convey our special thanks to your director. Will do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. Have a good one, everybody. Bye. I know some people joined late, so we're sorry about that. We're just about the end of the broadcast. So we, we're going to play it back. Um, we'll send the links to everyone for for this webinar. Thank you very much and please join us again next week Wednesday.